from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead today from the IGP Institute here at K-State, Guy Allen will offer his monthly observations on the international grain markets. He'll comment on the potential for increased U.S. wheat sales to China, as well as the chances for maintaining the current U.S. feed grain and soybean export pace. Then on the latest edition of FSA Coffee Talk from the Farm Service Agency, David Shem will look ahead to the next General Conservation Reserve Program sign-up, which will take place early in the new year. And later on this week's Wildlife Management segment, K-Stage Charlie Lee on a new study of bald eagles inhabiting upland areas, here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Good to have you along for this Agriculture Today. As we start off this edition, we'll get perspectives on that latest USDA World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates report on grains. From the IGP Institute here at Kansas State, Guy Allen, the senior economist there, and in that position, he certainly has a a great vantage point on these trades, what's going on with uh, the international grain market scene. Guy, as we look at this, it was a rather tranquil set of numbers here, except for one particular grain, and that is wheat. Friendly signals there. That probably was the headliner out of all of this, wasn't it? Yes, it's uh, it's not unusual to have the December report be rather uh, neutral and uh, a non-event. Although I'd have to say Thursday morning on the open, uh, the markets were showing a bit of strength, and it sort of gave an indication there might be a few surprises in it. But there were really very few surprises in it. Uh, the one bright spot, I think, was uh, some supportive wheat information. This uh, sort of quiet December report, I think, actually does set the stage for some volatility in January in the next report. We get some final production numbers and some other final numbers in January, and January always promises to be a pretty key report. It's the first report in the new year and sort of sets the stage for the the rest of the marketing year. It really is the uh, main event, if you will, comparing the two. But what about the wheat numbers and what uh, what got that complex excitement? Well, looking at the wheat numbers, they came in below trade expectations. World wheat ending stocks were cut by 4 million metric tons, which took the ending stocks of world, world wheat stocks down to 316 million metric tons. In addition, U.S. ending stocks were lowered as well by about 15 million bushels. They were dropped to 862 million bushels. And this was due to an increase in exports of about 10 million bushels, as well as about a 5 million bushel drop in imports. And it's good to see ending stocks dropping on on good sales and and good export numbers. That's always a, a good supporter of market values. If I could turn to the world situation on production of uh, various countries. Uh, Look, a number of countries were left unchanged. Argentina, surprisingly, was left at 18 million metric tons. With the dry weather down there, both Argentina and Brazil were paying very close attention to, not only on wheat, but on corn and beans in particular. The U.S. uh, was left unchanged at 49.7 million tons. The Ukraine at 25 and a half. We did see larger numbers put out by the USDA for Australia at 30 million metric tons. Uh, Having spent a lot of time in Australia, I'd suggest that number is probably still a little light. Trade estimates for Australia are probably closer to 32 or over 33 million metric tons. They're expecting that to be the second largest wheat crop that they've had, which is good to see after three years of drought. And I must say the quality that's being reported coming out of Australia is is quite good this year. Keep in mind, Australia is a white wheat producer. Russia was uh, increased up to 4 million metric tons, up a half a million tons. 
some of these numbers were offset a bit because we did see a half a million ton increase in China's imports to 8.5 million tons. And that's one of the larger numbers that I think we've seen since the 1990s for wheat imports for China, which is good to see them in the market for not only corn and soybeans, but starting to buy wheat. And they generally buy some higher quality wheat situation. Yeah. And before we leave the China wheat scene, is China by any chance guy feeding any wheat to its livestock? Because livestock consumption has been what's prompted a lot of business in the feed grains and soybeans. Look, that's that's a very good question, and we continue to ask that trade. And if you look at just the prices today in China, corn is over $10 a bushel in China. So there's there's a lot of commodity moving that way. Imported wheat would come in just under that at the moment. When I reflected on those world ending stock numbers for uh, wheat at 316 million metric ton, China holds about 35 percent, a little over a third of that volume. And not unlike their corn situation, you always wonder what the quality of that is. But I think, well, I know for sure wheat is being fed. And uh, particularly, it gives the Chinese an opportunity to really clean up, I think, uh, any potential quality issues they have in their inventory and their their longer-term stocks as they can now move that into the feed channels uh, pretty aggressively at these levels. Let's move to the other grains that came in with less fanfare out of this report. Corn, very much matching expectations uh, across the board. Yeah, no real surprises in corn. Ending stocks, uh, both globally and the U.S., remained pretty much unchanged. There were some change to, to country numbers. We did see the USDA raise Chinese imports again by 3.5 million metric tons to 16.4 million metric tons. But if you look at current export sales and shipments to China, which are just under 12 million metric tons this week, and then we've got about six over 6.5 million metric tons of uh, sales to unknown category – which uh, conservatively I'd suggest half, and I think the trade would suggest maybe two-thirds of that volume is going to China. Well, that puts us up pretty close to that 16 million metric tons. And keep in mind that 16 million ton number is for all corn, whether it's coming from the Ukraine or the U.S. or South America. So, you know, the U.S. is doing a good job of putting corn into to China at this, this point through the marketing year. Looking at some of the the other numbers, Ukraine corn crop, speaking of the Ukraine, was increased by a million metric tons, just on better than expected production there this season. And they did raise their exports correspondingly by, by a million and a half tons. Again, uh, as I said, the Ukraine is probably one of our bigger competitors into Asia in, in the corn market. Argentina's crop, on the other hand, was dropped back a million metric tons on the back of dry weather, as we mentioned, to 45 million metric tons. And world corn ending stocks were cut by a modest 2.5 million metric tons to just under 289 million, which leaves us in a fairly tight situation, particularly when you take out China holds, I think, two-thirds of the ending stocks for corn which is significant. So it only leaves the exporting countries with uh, with a handful there. And we're going to be watching that South American weather particularly and the progress of Brazil and uh, Argentine's crop as we move forward. I think the key drivers for that corn market as we move into the new year is going to be further Chinese buying as well as buying. We're seeing good buying interest from Southeast Asia as their livestock sector also recovers from African swine fever and continues to grow, as well as uh, as South American weather. That's going to be the drivers. Speaking of Chinese buying once again, grain sorghum numbers out of the USDA's report did capture this seeming insatiable appetite to for grain sorghum on the part of the Chinese. Yes, even though they didn't... Uh, really changed the sorghum balance sheet. We did see a drop in domestic consumption and uh, an increase in exports. So they basically, I think most of that came out of the uh, ethanol sector and feed sector. And that's basically a one-to-one substitution with uh, corn demand going in there. So uh, quite interesting dynamics in sorghum. Sorghum values are quite strong, not only nearby. FOB values are $3 basis over the March or higher. Uh, That leaves us at about $2.30 $2.30 premium to corn, uh, which is quite, quite strong. And we're seeing good premiums for new crop sorghum out there already, uh, which it's going to be interesting when we get to planting 
how we compete for area. You bet. And we'll round this off by talking of the soybean numbers, not only soybeans themselves, but the meal and oil demand out there. There's some interesting dynamics, you say. Yeah. Soybeans, no real surprises in the number. Our carryout number only dropped 1 million metric tons to 85 million. Argentine soybean crop production was lowered a million metric tons as well with their corn, again, on, on dry weather. No change to China's import numbers for soybeans. They left it at 100 million metric tons, which is a record import number. I think last month when I was in here and talked to you, there was some suggestion by the USDA attache in China that that could drop to 95 million metric tons. And that wouldn't surprise me, but uh, this month they left that number unchanged. Also, we're seeing good demand from the uh, U.S. uh, crushing industry as we're seeing good demand for both meal and particularly oil exports, which is leaving us with good crushing margin and good crushing demand across that whole sector as well. All in all, again, this WASDE report rather calm with respect to grain supply and demand, as you say. As we finish off here, that January report may stir things up more, you think? Well, there's a lot of geopolitical issues driving the the markets here as well. And I think there's a potential demand, particularly in the feed grain sector. And the particular commodity that I think will tend to lead this will be corn. Uh, We've got increasing tightness. There seems to be good pent-up demand that hasn't really come to the market yet, particularly from uh, potentially China or Southeast Asia. And we start to put a few more export sales on, and we could see that corn price respond to additional demand pretty quickly. So that's what I'm sort of watching. The other thing is, and as I always mention, I always watch is this exchange rate, how much money not only the U.S. but other countries continue to print for uh, economic stimulus is going to be key as well. The January being the first report in the new year, I think, is going to sort of set the stage for the rest of the marketing year. And I think the uh, USDA economists come back from their Christmas New Year holiday, refresh and rested, and uh, do some serious number crunching then. And uh, and we also get some final numbers for this past year's production to lock that in. So, yeah, January is always an, an interesting report. Guy, we always appreciate your take on the international grain market, so we eagerly look forward to that report and what you have to say about it when it comes out. If you're willing, we'll have you back then. Thank you, Eric. We'll see everyone in the new year. Likewise, thank you. Senior economist with the IGP Institute, Kansas State University, Guy Allen, and we'll be back on Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. For you next on Agriculture Today, our regular session on what's happening with USDA programs in the state of Kansas on behalf of you producers, FSA Coffee Talk, and joining us once more from the Farm Service Agency State Office for Kansas is the Executive Director, David Shem. Welcome back, David. And even though we are into the wintertime now, not officially, but closely so, Things are not slowing down all that much at your FSA outlets, are they? No, they aren't, Eric. And, you know, we are wrapping up the calendar year. Uh, We've got some uh, programs that deadlines have come past. We're working on finishing, getting a few producers signed up. With uh, Some of those, even the the deadlines have have gotten past where they've gotten signed up. And so we're having to interact. them. obviously with the challenges with pandemic and offices out there and and our offices having locked door and having to deal with producers from an email or virtual standpoint presents greater challenges. But we've got new programs still coming on. You know, there's, uh, as I told my employees the other day, there's still work to get done out there, and we're going to have to figure out a way to get her done. And they will, no doubt about it. 
just what have you tied off recently as far as those sign-up closures? Well, you know, here just recently, uh, we had our dairy margin coverage program. The sign-up ended uh, for uh, 2021, ended here on December 11th. You know, we just got done uh, with a a full certification of of acreage on December 15th, uh, as well as CFAP2. That deadline closed out on the 11th as well. And then, of course, uh, WIP Plus, December 8th, uh, we're, we're wrapping that up. The deadline has passed there, but we're trying to finish working with those customers as we wrap up uh, the WIP Plus deadline there as well. And so, you know, it's been it's been one of those years. I know I've commented uh, before, but when I kind of look at some of those programs as we're wrapping them up, uh, CFAP2, you know, we've had over 64,000 applications across the state of Kansas and, and right at $630 million that we've issued out to our producers on that fall uh, acreage uh, certification. Again, we're finishing getting some of the producers still in here uh, on that, uh, working with them. They've contacted our office. We put them down on a register, and we're finished working with getting them signed up on their acreage. But WIP Plus, I talked about that. You know, we're finishing working out with some of those producers with over 15,000 applications there, over $60 million sent out there for WIP Plus. And we wrapped up here, uh, you know, a little while ago with our PLC sign up for obviously 2020 had over 102,000 signups for our PLC but I thought it was interesting as I was kind of reviewing some of the data for our state here you know we've already at 35 percent sign up for the new year for our PLC so obviously offices have been busy out there working with producers helping to get producers signed up for the various program and then of course I uh, definitely want to mention uh, a couple other programs here CRP sign up Obviously, a big one for us this year, we had a half a million, 500,000 acres expire in 2020 this year. So I've been very busy in trying to get that program all signed up for our producers. Speaking of CRP, quickly, there's another opportunity coming up for those interested in that program? Absolutely is, and I know it's pretty uh, high on the uh, radar for a lot of our producers out there. This coming year in 2021, we have over 360,000 acres that will be expiring, and so we're going to be having a general sign-up start on January 4th, and just for everybody to be aware of that sign-up for the uh, general CRP runs from January 4th through February 12th, and so that'll be opening up, allowing those producers to come in there and find out about uh, the next sign-up. want to mention again, for producer standpoint, Eric, that obviously with the 2018 Farm Bill, it was a little bit of a change up, but there is now an annual sign up for those CRP acres. So again, every year producers will be afforded that opportunity to be a sign up as those acres expire. Obviously, we have to work within the cap as issued by the 2018 Farm Bill on total CRP acres. And the criteria for eligibility is standardized year by year, much the same as the previous sign up? Absolutely. You know, there's a few programs when we look at what we call uh, conservation plans for our producers, a few changes within some of those conservation plans uh, to help uh, qualify producers or help them to look at various plans they can enact on that CRP when they do sign up for those programs. So those get changed or tweaked, make sure that they're truly what we're targeting or what we need to have happen out there on those CRP acres. You know, a couple of the other uh, CRP signups that will how I should I say, have been added. So CRP grasslands is one that some of our producers have definitely looked at. Uh, we're going to be having an enrollment starting up here in, in March 15th of this uh, coming year as well there. And, of course, I, I should mention continuous CRP, that program there, that's an ongoing sign-up that, that does not have an expiration date for uh, producers to be able to look at you know targeted areas, buffer strips, various things like that that they want to sign up. So CRP is on the radar for the early part of 2021. Producers, be aware of all of those opportunities. And you mentioned that 35% of the sign-up for 2021 ARC and PLC is already in the books. Again, those programs and the opportunity to choose year by year is in place. Absolutely. It is an uh, an annual sign-up. Part of the 2018 Farm Bill was that initially it was a two-year sign-up for both 18 and 19, and then each year after 
after that, it was just an annual election uh, on for which program they had. A lot of our producers uh, out there signed up for whichever program the entire five years. The neat thing about that, it let them sign up, Eric, but if they chose to change their mind, absolutely not a problem. They could definitely change their mind. One of the things, you know, I got to definitely mention as well is our farm loan programs and our loan programs this year and, and the amount of activity that we have had on that. It's just been amazing, the interest that producers have shown. To what extent? Do you have numbers? I do have a few numbers here, you know, and, and so, you know, obviously working with both uh, operating loans, direct operating loans, as, and as well as ownership, you know, farm ground ownership, as well as guaranteed loans there. But our increase in the amount of loans that we've approved this year over 19 has been over 20%. And so just amazing the number of applications that we have increased over uh, the previous year, which saw an increase from the previous year. Uh, but then also I want to mention uh, farm storage uh, facility loans. So again, uh, I've talked about that in the past, opportunity for producers to come into us, any producer to come in, uh, kind of show need for his production that they have for whatever commodity or, or food they're working with there. We'll work with them as far as getting them a low interest loan. Uh, it's one of the areas that we've really been focused on to try to make sure we reach out to producers. We are up almost 60% in loan applications from the previous year. So mm. have had a lot of interest by uh, producers a way that truly we can be of service to our producers out there. And again, the loan program is open constantly. There's not a sign-up period there whatsoever whenever the individual has an interest in any of those USDA loan alternatives. Absolutely. That's uh, Farm Storage Facility Loan is open to any producer. Our uh, direct and uh, guaranteed uh, loan programs are open to beginning farmers, socially disadvantaged minority farmers, and, and farmers that are you know not able to obtain financing uh, from commercial creditors. All details, of course, on all of those found at your local FSA headquarters. You want to, David, now that we're putting the wraps on 2020, some are celebrating that, by the way, <laughs> but you wanted to share a message to producers about interacting with FSA folk and vice versa over these past 12 months, which have been, to put it mildly, challenging. Yeah, it really has been challenging, and I had the opportunity here to uh, write a couple of uh, messages out there to our employees across the state and also uh, producers across the state and had me do a little bit of thinking, as you said, as we round out towards the holiday season here. I, I kind of jotted down some notes and would like to share with everybody here. So, you know, wow, what a year 2020 has been for all of us. Kansas have all dealt with challenges with the pandemic and who would have ever thought toilet paper was so valuable? <laughs> We've dealt with challenges with commodity prices, challenges with weather. Uh, I thought of the Kansas motto the other day, ad astra per aspra, to the stars through difficulties. And it made me think of the resilience that all of our farmers, ranchers, friends, and family across the state have had. And yet we so often don't give ourselves credit. We think it is simply part of life. But in hindsight, we realize what incredible things we have accomplished. You know, it's like climbing that mountain. We look at the next step, the next handhold, as we seek to climb the hill, and we never realize how tall it is until we reach the top and look back down. As this year draws to a close, I have reflected on the challenges that our producers and Kansas FSA has faced the last few years, from floods to drought, government shutdowns to pandemic, low prices and trading wars. And I can really, truly appreciate how high the mountains we have scaled are, and yet how we have overcome them by simply taking the next step in front of us. As we enter into the holiday season, despite the many things that 2020 has thrown at us, there is much to be thankful for, for the mountains we have climbed. So I want to take this moment, and I want to express my appreciation to all of our Kansas producers for their dedication to feeding all of us, despite the challenges that, that they have faced this last year. Many may feel that it is unappreciated, but I say it from my heart. Thank you. Recently, I quoted T.S. Eliot. He once said, If you aren't in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? I think it's fair to say that our producers across the state have stood tall this year. So... Have a Merry Christmas, a Happy Holiday, and best wishes for a great New Year for myself and Kansas FSA. Well stated, and Happy Holidays to you and yours as well, David. We appreciate it, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Eric. 
He's the state executive director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas. That's David Shem with this latest FSA Coffee Talk on Agriculture Today. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome back to Agriculture Today, as we come to you from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here. Now, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. First, this note, the 2021 Kansas Soybean Expo, which was scheduled for January the 6th, has been canceled. The Kansas Soybean Association Expo Committee had been closely monitoring the event guidelines related to the pandemic and decided to cancel the event in the best interest of attendees. Now, results of the yield and value contests have historically been announced during the Expo luncheon, though the announcement will come differently. This year's winners will still receive special recognition. The KSA Board of Directors intends to have their annual membership meeting which has always been in conjunction with the Expo, in a virtual setting for those interested in participating. More information about attending that online meeting on January the 5th will be made available to current Kansas Soybean Association members directly. The Trump administration now plans on releasing its notice of proposed rulemaking yet this month on the proposed levels for 2021 biofuel and 2022 biodiesel levels under the Renewable Fuel Standard. The EPA had in May forwarded its proposed levels to the Office of Management and Budget for review, but they remain listed as being under review. In the meantime, indications are that the EPA has opted to rework the proposed levels to account for the impacts of the pandemic. It's not clear what the new rules from the EPA will say, but the regulatory agenda which revealed the action noted that the EPA is establishing volume requirements for cellulosic biofuel, advanced biofuel, and total renewable fuel that are below the statutory volume targets. The action puts the EPA on a path to finalize the levels in June of 2021 under the Biden administration. And that could result in one of the first biofuel decisions that the Biden administration will influence. And USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue has announced that the USDA's chief economist, Rob Johansson, will be leaving the department and that Seth Meyer will return to the USDA to be the new chief economist. Currently, Meyer is the associate director for the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute, or FAPRI, at the University of Missouri. Meyer was previously the head of the World Agricultural Outlook Board in the Office of Chief Economist. He was also at one time an economist with the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. And yesterday, and for the first time, the Food and Drug Administration approved a line of genetically altered domestic pigs for food use to eliminate alpha-gal sugar, which can cause people to have an allergic reaction to red meats. The FDA had never approved an intentional genomic alteration in animals for both food and medicinal purposes. The FDA Commissioner Stephen Hahn described yesterday's action as, in his words, a tremendous milestone for scientists scientific innovation. Prior to yesterday, the the FDA had approved four genetically altered animals, three for medical use, one for food use. For food, the FDA had approved genetically engineered salmon back in 2015. Now, gall-safe pigs, as they're called, would produce meat mainly for people affected by alpha-gall syndrome, which can cause anywhere from mild to severe allergic reactions, mainly diagnosed when people become allergic to red meats such as pork, beef, or lamb. Alpha-gall is a sugar formed in mammal meat or blood, but not in humans. Alpha-gal syndrome, a fairly recently recognized allergen, spreading mainly through lone star tick bites, and the expanded range of those ticks across the country has led to more diagnoses for alpha-gal syndrome in recent years. Gal-safe pigs were created by Revivacor, that's a Virginia-based biotechnology company, 
A spokesperson for that company said it had been working on Golf Safe Pigs since 2007. Next up for you, this week's edition of Milk Lines. Standing by with that, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike. Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairymen concerning cold weather calf care. As we approach the winter season, we need to recognize a few things about the young calves that we have on our dairies. First, their thermal neutral zone is actually between 60 and 75 degrees, so anytime the temperature drops below 60 degrees, our calves experience cold stress. Another thing you need to recognize is that the calves on your farm have very little body fat, usually only about 3 to 4 percent, so they really don't have very much reserves. So they really need to take in enough energy every day to provide for growth as well as to keep them warm. As you look at the standard feeding that you might be doing, particularly for calves that are milk-fed, you're probably feeding 8 to 10 ounces of a milk replacer a couple times a day. Actually, that's not enough energy for growth as well as warmth during a situation where we have cold stress. So I want to give you a few tips. You might want to consider three times a day feeding rather than twice a day feeding, particularly when the high temperatures are, say, between 40 and 50 degrees every day and our low temperatures are dropping down below 30 and maybe into even the low 20s. You might want to consider adding that extra feeding over the noon time, so morning, noon, and night, rather than just morning and night. Now, what if it gets colder? What if our high temperatures are only maybe reaching zero or the single digits during the day? Maybe need to think about 4X feeding then. So feeding in the morning, a second feeding late morning, one in the mid-afternoon, and then one in the evening will provide extra nutrients to those animals. You can also consider using a higher fat milk replacer. Maybe your current one is only 20%. Switching to something that's, say, 23, 24, or 25% will give your animals extra nutrients. A couple other things to consider. You need to encourage water intake because dehydration is a problem. So feeding warm water to the calves, that'd be water that was between 100 and 102 degrees, will increase intake. For those younger calves, feeding fresh starter feed once daily is very, very important, as well as deep bedding. How about calf blankets? Have you started to use calf blankets on your dairy? If you haven't, for your younger calves, this is very, very important during very cold weather. Try to help keep them warm and keep them growing. And then finally, make sure that you keep the animals hydrated. Warm water mentioned earlier is important. And it's also important to increase the number of feeding each day rather than just increasing the concentration of milk replacer powder in that mix that you're feeding. So again, feeding three or four times a day during extreme cold weather is very, very important in helping improving the hydration of the calves. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging you to consider what you might do to improve the ability of your calves to withstand cold stress. Thanks, Mike. K-State's Charlie Lee is standing by for his weekly visit. That's next on Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus. So if you have a fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going in. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, more on wildlife management. And visiting once again with former wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension, Charlie Lee. Well, Charlie, we'll talk about what has been uh, undoubtedly a, a resounding success story in wildlife conservation. The recovery of the bald eagle, as well as a new study on its habitat preferences, but again, we see bald eagles in more and more places. Yes, it is a wonderful success story. We've talked many times about the problems with the Endangered Species Act, but this is truly a success story of that act. Currently, the bald eagle has been removed from all federal and state threatened and endangered species list. It still has some protection under the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, as well as the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So it's a violation to take that individual. But we see them so frequently now, uh, this time of year and on through January and February, that we almost take bald eagles for granted. 
certainly not always been the case. Uh, there was no bald eagle nest found in the entire state of Kansas from the time it was first settled until 1989. So rare through the lower 48 states that a special act in Congress was passed in 1940 to stop people from shooting and poisoning this symbol of our nation. And that really wasn't enough to save the bald eagle because it still had problems with eggshells that were so thin, probably linked to DDT, that when the females tried to incubate those eggs, they crushed and were not successful at nesting. But currently, we've got nests in Kansas. I'm not sure of the exact number, but I do know that the number is, goes up each and every year, as well as it is in most of the lower 48 states. So people have done a good job of protecting them, uh, reducing the mortality factors, and they've responded quite well. And as most know, their preferred habitat is somewhere near a water body where they can feast on fish, primarily aquatic life, as one of their main staples. But there's been new research on their increasing presence in upland areas, you say. Well, there was a research report published in the Journal of Wildlife Management recently that looked at upland and riparian areas, the use of those areas by wintering bald eagles, and what potential implications that might have for wind energy. We know that about 6.5% of the energy used in the United States is produced by wind power. Uh, we're seeing more and more wind farms going up in Kansas. Uh, there's probably some risk, as now we're getting uh, more and more bald eagles. But most of the wind farms in Kansas are on upland sites. Bald eagles are in Kansas uh, in late winter because some of our river systems below the large reservoirs, below those outlets, stay open. And that provides opportunity for these eagles to find fish that have come through uh, those outlet systems. And the uh, eagles congregate in those locations, which is not near where most of our wind farms are located. But that's not the case in all other states. There are few numbers of bald eagles that have been killed by wind farms. Most of those have been killed in the upper Midwest United States, especially in Iowa. So this particular study was focused in Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Wisconsin, uh, Illinois, and looked at where bald eagles are in relation to weather conditions and come up with some interesting findings. I'll go over those if you would. What do we know about their tendencies in upland areas that we didn't know before? Well, we know that they're partial migrants, meaning that some individuals are residents and others are migrate just short or long distances. In the upper Midwest, in the Mississippi River drainage system and its tributaries, that's where a, a high numbers of bald eagles winter. We know after this particular study, when they looked at the habitat use by eagles in response to variation in weather and the time of year, that eagles use riparian areas more when the wind speed and the atmospheric pressure was low. The exclusive use of uplands was more frequent during weather systems with low pressure, high humidity, and after long periods of cold weather. There was a nonlinear response to time of year which was measured in days before migration in the frequency of exclusive use in uplands or riparian areas. So the probability of exclusive use of either of those landscapes was generally constant within about 95 days prior to migration. But the probability of use of riparian areas was less during the dates that were more than 100 days before migration. So th these results suggest that eagles are most likely to be exposed to wind energy uh, developments that are located in the upland areas during low pressure systems uh, after long periods of cold weather and several months before the onset of spring migration. So if we try to kind of think through that, Typically, after a sustained length of time of cold weather, some of those 
river systems are going to freeze over. Those water bodies are going to reduce access to eagles to some of the fish that would normally be found. And they'll probably have to widen their search area in order to find adequate food resources. So is this a problem in the making, do you think, in the cause of eagle conservation? Well, I think it's one that those folks that are opposed to wind energy will probably promote in that they're going to be a potential new source of mortality. Uh, And as bald eagle numbers increase and wind turbines increase, I think it's going to also uh, restrict some of the areas that bald eagles can use. And I think folks will have to be more careful in siting requirements to make sure that those turbines are put in locations where bald eagles are less likely to occur after these weather systems move through. Enlightening information on how bald eagles have moved beyond their normal riparian area preferences to other areas like upland and just how much of an issue that could be. Charlie, thank you for going over this with us. Longtime wildlife specialist Charlie Lee, K-State Research and Extension. And with that, our Tuesday edition comes to a close. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.